I want to encourage everybody again to um, provide uh, down on the bottom, there is a QA pod. So I want to encourage everybody to go ahead and provide your questions down in the uh, Q&A pod. But I'm joined by Jen, Bob, Tony, Jerry, and Kelly all uh, here today. So that's, that's fantastic. So um, there's been tons of dialogue on teams and groups. Uh, so, and I, and I think even, even still there's general confusion right now, given that Teams is not yet available in the government community cloud on, on what is the relationship within groups and teams and how we can leverage groups to prepare for teams. So I want to throw it out to our panel and, you know, let's go ahead and, you know, Bob, let's start with you, you know, let's start describing and, and make sure our attendees understand how the relationship between groups and teams then maybe somebody else can pick up the pre preparation answer. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, you know, Jen sort of hinted at this, right? When she didn't list groups specifically when she was sort of breaking down the relationship between what to use when, and that's because groups is really a foundational element. Yes, it, it was the glue that first said, hey, let's connect multiple services across the Office 365 tenant to build a collaboration environment, right? So, so if we're thinking, you know, so at no point, you know, I don't think of groups and teams as being a decision as to which platform you make. What I think of is groups as the foundation for teams and other services like teams that we haven't even talked about yet, right? That are maybe coming in the future. Now, you know, Jen sort of alluded to it um, earlier is, you know, if, if you want to use, you know, Outlook and email as a, the central portal to, to get into this collaboration experience, right, that's really, that's, Groups handles that all on its own without the benefit of having these other layers put on like Teams, right? But if you want sort of some of these other capabilities, they are just, you know, they're layered on top of groups, right? So, so you know, if I'm planning and I'm a government customer, right? Because this is, I, I got to say, Steve, this is like the number one question I'm getting right now from my government customers is, you know, what I, you know, I want Teams. I wish it was coming immediately. We know it's not, right? Um, you know, it's on the way, um, all of those kinds of things, but it's not here yet. So, you know, I don't want to go down the wrong path and deploy groups, et cetera, right? The answer is you're not, right? Groups sort of establishes this paradigm of, you know, spinning up virtual groups of people to work on things in a project centric view. The only difference will be today for groups, right? Your client is Outlook really more or less. Yes, you can go to the web, you can go, there's a couple of ways you can get there. But to me, my access to groups is through the little groups tab in, in Outlook, right? And so, um, you know, that's sort of the view you have. But as we, sh you know, the good news is I can essentially check a box and quote unquote upgrade my group to a team when teams come. And those communities and those interactions are already established, right? There's content behind it. That content gets tied directly to teams just like it would if you created the team from the get-go. So you're not losing much other than sort of the interface, some of the persistent chat stuff, and then integration with third-party stuff, which is really intriguing about teams long-term. But you still need a group underneath of it. And I don't know, Jen, if you had anything to add. No, groups is just that membership contract. And so once you have that membership, you can go and do things with your group. And it just happens that in the government cloud right now, the things that you can go and do with the group are limited by the tool set that's available. But you could still create the groups, manage the groups, uh, go through your experience. Like you said, Outlook Online will give you a lot of the experiences or Outlook, even the client will give you a lot of the experiences and you would start there. And then once Teams is available, once Planner is available, then you could just utilize those extra features as well. Does anybody on the panel have, want to add anything to that or specifically around any of the preparation for Teams? Well, I think the only thing I'd add, Steve, is that there's, as we talked earlier a little bit on the, in the recorded session, there's, it's all about the, the end user experience to start with. So if, if you're doing any prep work with respect to either whether you're going to create group, groups, teams, 
or collaborating in the SharePoint side of the house, uh, understanding where your, where your end users are coming into that data first is going to be critical. And the planning for that, uh, defining uh, those things in advance so that you can collaborate as a team or collaborate as a large group uh, allows you to establish security and parameters around how you want to distribute that content. I think the only planning that would be added to that to this conversation would be a lot of the security and governance planning that I think Bob talked about in the first session, uh, which which should be a, a critical or integral part of your your planning for these types of things. Yeah, we also have a very comprehensive uh, website, you know, aka.ms slash Skype in Teams. I'll put it in the uh, chat window as well so that people have it for reference. But th that's like the landing place to go to to take a look at, you know, governance and planning and, and uh, design for moving to Teams. Yeah, that's a fantastic resource, Tony. So uh, we have another question here. Uh, so I, I think we've covered this, but at the, at the interest of being as thorough as possible. Um, so there was, there was a question about converting groups to teams. I believe we've addressed it, but maybe we just want to address it one more time. Yeah, whenever you go into teams and you want to create a new team, you're going to be able to see uh, create a new team just from scratch, or you can go select any of the teams where you're an owner of, and then you can go create a team off of that group. So it's just part of the menu when you go into teams to create new teams. Do I use an existing group or create a new one? Yeah, so, yeah. just one observation though. It has to be a private group, Office 365 group. It can't be a public Office 365 group. Uh, so continuing down this conversation around uh, around groups and Kelly, uh, I see you've addressed it in the window, so I'll point it to you. Do you find that you know most state and local or you know public sector organizations allow end users to build their own O365 groups, or they lock it down in a central organization? No. So I have seen where they do allow the end users to create their own groups because to get the the full fill and not having. Um, to have IT to manage those groups specifically takes kind of a weight off of them. Um, however, they are sure to address the question of at any given time or for whatever specific situation, if they do need their administrators to shut down a specific group, then they are allotted those particular uh, permissions and privileges and policies that can be set up to allow them to do so. But for the ease and, and the whole point in using groups is to kind of take that management away from the admin and IT level and allow those end users to still have that flexibility in being able to, um, to quickly move on and collaborate with a specific set of people. Yeah, I, I would add too, I, I think there's two reasons why this is even a question, right? right? So one is sort of security compliance related, right? And the reality is, I mean, users are, doing things like groups and sharing documents in OneDrive, et cetera, and creating their own list of collaborators today, right? In almost all cases with Office 365. So like, I don't feel like that's adding too much new to the, to the paradigm there, right? You know, and, you know, unless you're not enabling any of those things already, right? And then, you know, there's a broader conversation in your org to talk about. The other reason is sort of more of a governance one. And this is an area where they've had a, quite a bit of improvements in the last couple of months, right? And recent updates to, to groups, right? Which is you can require sort of some naming conventions and some things like that that are in new administrative capabilities that are in the group group's admin console that you can say, because one of the problems that, you know, I think in one of the first sessions we referenced, you know, our, our government customer in the Southeast that had, you know, a thousand or more groups, like almost instantaneous, there were no admin controls there at all. And the, one of the problems they had was, I've got all these groups with all kinds of crazy names all over the place and nobody knows what the heck any of them mean. And so that was one piece of early feedback to say, hey, we can require that you put a department code in and you do a couple of things so that at least they can sort of align logically when I'm scrolling down, right? Because if I have a 50,000 seat organization, I'm going to have a lot of groups, right? And, and so, you know, to go back to your, the original question out there, I would say the majority are allowing users to create groups. And, and that there are some that are not, it is taking on a lot of, that, that does require taking on a, a big 
a, you know, a, a, a heavy burden to create these because the whole idea of groups is for Steve and Kelly and Jen and Jerry and I to just say, we're getting ready to do this presentation. We need a group, right? And, and more than likely that group lives and dies in a period of a month or two, right? In many, many cases, right? And so, um, you know, do we really want to burden IT with that? Exactly. Okay, great. Um, so I got we got a couple more questions. Again, I want to encourage everybody to please enter your any questions you have in the Q and A pod at the bottom. Uh, one of the questions, and I'm sort of combining questions here, and is there, you know there's obviously a lot of conversation in this session and on the blogs and portals, and of course in, between our customers themselves and our own communities of interest around when are these things like bookings and planner and teams going to become available in the government cloud, and I think. You know, Tony, Kelly, it might be worthwhile from a Microsoft perspective to, first of all, talk a little bit to make sure everybody understands the process by which these things get available in the government cloud in a, in a high level, and then we can address where people can go for more information. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'd say if you have an account team, that's the first place to reach out to to, you know, to uh, ask some of those questions because a lot of this information uh, you know, is available, but it might be under NDA, non-disclosure agreements. So uh, you'd have to have an NDA signed and you can get more specific information from your, your account team. But uh, a lot of this information is uh, available up on the, um, on the Office 365 roadmap, roadmap.office.com. So, you know, so for example, you know, Planner in GCC, Teams in GCC, there's a line item in there for both of those products. However, you know, there's no data. It just explains that the reason that it takes longer for these products to be deployed to to the GCC, the Government Community Cloud, is due to compliance, security and compliance concerns. Yeah, and specifically to bookings, unfortunately, we do not have a roadmap date as of yet um, in regards to bookings. Yeah, I think its original attention for bookings was in small business scenarios. And while I can get why there might be some reasons that government agencies might be interested in that, I don't, I haven't heard anybody talk about it on the roadmap at all at this point. You're, I think you're on mute, Steve. You know, I've been doing this all day. It was bound to happen one time. <laughs> I've been saying it all day. We call it live TV. It's live TV. <laughs> so uh, one of the things I was going to say in a shameless plug is that uh, at Planet Technologies customers, we have a program called You Already Own It Clouds Advisory Service. It's a no charge program. And um, if you're interested in that, you can contact us. But one of the one of the benefits of that program is, you know, some of the information around release dates and when these things are gonna become available from your Planet Technology Advisor, who obviously works close with our Microsoft friends. Uh, I, I wanna throw out a uh, scenario for everybody, because I think one of the challenges that we have when we have all these tools, not to mention some third party tools from other providers, is how we manage and you know, best practices around managing that desktop environment, not just from an end user usability perspective, but also from a, you know, how do these things actually work together on the same desktop. So we have a customer that contacted us just the other day. This customer's uh, management has made a decision for some reason, we're not quite sure, to leverage Spark for voice as opposed to Skype for business. So there are people who actually run their environment uh, who this decision was made above them uh, are co concerned about how they're gonna be able to you know, have end users with multiple desktop clients that do similar things as well as will these things work together and interact together. So from our panel, is there any comments or ideas on how to make sure those things work together and how to help end users adopt potentially multiple cloud, multiple desktop applications? That one's going to end up being a, a tricky one, I think. I think they're going to just have to educate users on where you're going to go for certain activities. Um, when it comes to integration, Teams has got, you know, the bot framework and stuff like that. And I was actually, after we talked yesterday, Steve, I was looking at some of the bots that they have between uh, Spark and Teams. So you might find something there where there's going to be some level of integration where the two systems can talk to each other. But that's where training and education for your users is going to be key. 
um, because if I know anything about end users, they don't like to be confused and you usually get about one, maybe two chances um, before they just ignore you completely because they don't have time for extra levels of confusion. So that's going to be an interesting one that's going to require a lot of testing and figuring out how it's going to work and then really understanding your users and how they can work through the system so you guide them to the right to the right experience. All right, and for, further to that, you know, there, you know, I, I was meeting with a customer uh, last week and found out they've been they've been deploying Skype for a while. Then the telecoms team decided to purchase uh, Cisco Jabber, so now they've got choices for the customer. So they're not going to choose one or the other. They're going to let the customer uh, decide which product uh, makes the most sense. And I echo Jen's comment about uh, you know, education and awareness. And Microsoft has some of you know some some uh, IP, you know, we got this customer immersion event, you can contact your account team, I contact Planet, and it walks the customer through a day in the life scenario in which uh, it shows how the, uh, the Microsoft products are integrated so well together so that they can get their jobs done. Yeah, and I would just add just to twist this conversation a little bit, um, you know, because I think part of this was, hey, there, you know, team slash Skype, right? And what does that mean? And what's that experience, et cetera. Um, so to be clear, right, you know, there's a lot of customers that have gone down this path of deploying Skype for business and have deeply sort of gravitated around leveraging that in their business practices, right? This integration of, um, this integration of teams um, with, you know, to sort of take the place of Skype for business client um, doesn't mean a that they're kicking the Skype for business client out of the tenant anytime soon. And particularly in our government customers, which is who's on this call, right? Um, they, the, the Skype for business client is going to be the primary client, you know, at least until team shows up, right? When we, you know, that's not here yet. Right. So, so, you know, I can say today, um, the, the the you know I can say today that um, you know we can uh, you know that you can use Skype for Business and Teams clients uh, in for instance Planet we use Teams all the time you can use Skype for Business client on one side and Teams client on the other side and they can work together and and I know by the way that's, that wasn't what this conversation was about but it was a side topic that I think there was also confusion on so I sort of jumped off in that direction just because it was sort of a platform to do it. I was just going to cap off, you know, from a, a conversational topic, we talk about integration, but I spend a great deal of time, just like Bob does, when we, we talk about integration and guidance and direction with our clients every day where the rubber hits the road and when you're trying to implement this stuff. And in every single case, the implementation and integration conversation says, from our point of view, here's how the Microsoft products work and here's the feature function or the capability you're trying to employ. Uh, uh, that, that is a third party product. And that in most cases, almost every single case we've dealt with, um, that third party product has integration um, instructions and guidance to allow that integration to work with the 365 stack. So in, in almost every single case, we spend a great deal of time talking about where that capability fits and then provide that guidance from that third party provider. That's fantastic. Well, uh, what a great conversation. Thank you for my panel. I, we really appreciate it. Um, our next session, which is going to start at 415, which is the last session we have of the day, it's uh, seeing the power, the power of 365. Definitely something you want to make sure you come back for. That starts at 415. If you're not familiar, if you have not seen what Dynamics 365 and CRM online and XRM online can do for you, please make sure you get it back. We're actually going to have a customer provide a demonstration of how it's, you know, how profound effect in their environment. It's going to be an important session. That's 415, sorry, uh, 415, yes, 5 to 515. I want to thank our panel, Jen, Bob, Tom, Tony, Jerry, and Kelly. Their contact information is here. Feel free to follow them um, and feel free to contact them um, with any questions. We look forward to hearing from you. See you at 415. Thanks. Thanks.